Hey everybody, it's Gauntletax, and welcome to the second Outlaws of Thunder Junction Arena Open. Today we'll be playing Day 2 Draft Number 1, where we'll be competing in best of three rounds of Outlaws of Thunder Junction Draft, trying to win at least three of the next four matches to qualify for Day 2 Draft Number 2, where there's cash prizes up to $2,000 on the line. Day 2 is qualification only, and we've only got one shot here. If we fail on this first draft, we are out of the event, so let's hope that we get some good pulls and build a solid deck here. But without further ado, let's see where the cards take us today. Alright, here we are for our pack 1, pick 1. We don't have any incredible mono-colored options here, which is what I usually like to start with to keep things pretty open. The best ones there are Throw from the Saddle, probably the number one for cheap removal for any green deck, but... Holy Cow is a decent creature. Nimble Brigand can be a good card draw engine. I don't think any of these are strong enough to push me off of taking one of the nice multicolored cards here, though. We have Malcolm the Eyes, which puts us into the weakest color pair in the format, or at least one of the weakest, but for the strongest card in this pack. Two mana, two, two flying haste that can consistently draw us extra cards off of some clue tokens. Or Jolene, which puts us into a significantly stronger color pair since we have access to green and honestly isn't massively weaker than Malcolm here. I think these are kind of the picks we're forced with. I don't think we really have a good, well, a great pick for staying open. Best would be like throw from the saddle, I guess. Maybe I do take that over Jolino Malcolm here, but I'll just go for the Malcolm here. I'll go for the raw power out of that one. Worst case scenario, we just don't end up playing the pack one pick one, which is fine in a pack like that. I don't think that pack was super powerful. Pick two now. Vault Plunderer is one of the best monocolored cards, probably the best. It's a lot more flexible than Betrayal at the Vault just because it's great in your opening hand or as a top deck later, whereas Betrayal is super expensive. You got to draw this much later in the game. We could just immediately start with two blue red spells, but then if we're fighting over blue or red at all, we're going to be in a really rough position because those colors aren't particularly deep. So fighting like a single other drafter that might be right next to us could be hard to find enough playables. Mirage Mace is the most flexible card here. We can put it in any deck as fixing, but Lush Oasis is the better fixing if we want to take fixing. I think I'll go for Vault Plunderer here, but I think Slick Sequence, Betrayal at the Vault, or one of these duels are the other options. I don't think we'd start with double blue-red cards this early on, so... I'm gonna go for the Vault Plunder there. Well, it's a Lila now. Pretty narrow, but if you have multiple copies of Slick Sequence, that's where this card can get pretty powerful. Whenever you cast a Multicolored Instant or Sorcery, you get to exile it instead of putting it into your graveyard so that you get to plot it and then cast it again next turn. So really good with multicolored instants and sorceries. There's just not a ton of multicolored instants and sorceries in the format, and it's one of the weakest color pairs in the set. She's not competing with all that much, honestly. It's between Lila and Patient Naturalist as the other good card here. Just green. Um, not really mana ramp, not really mana fixing, but somewhat both. Like, it tries to draw you an extra land off the top, but you don't get to, like, search a specific one or anything. Honestly, Festering Gulch is probably in the top three here as well, but I'm gonna go ahead and take that Lila. And if we wheel a slick sequence, we probably do play blue-red and never look back at that point. But for now, again, general blue and red commons just tend to be... Pretty filler and pretty weak to the point where we keep speculating until we see that slick sequence wheel, and if it does, then we just go all in. So pick four, we go like Ruthless Lawbringer to go with our Vault Plunderer towards a black-white deck, or we just take Desperate Bloodseeker to go two cards deep into black. This is a very flexible card. Black has good graveyard recursion, so you can target yourself with this thing, but there's also plenty of cards that want you to commit a lot of crimes where you can target your opponents. This is much better than it looks to where it might be worth taking over Lawbringer, um, just because it doesn't tie us into a second color to go along with our black, and we could play like Grixis here. A little harder to go full four, uh, four color with the Lawbringer, so I will go for the, uh, the Bloodseeker. And now pick five. Uh, Forlorn Flats towards black-white, now that I passed a black-white uncommon. Or we could take Mourner Surprise, which works fine with Self Mill, like Desperate Bloodseeker, but just with good Enter the Battlefield effects like Vault Plunder as well, this creature trades off really easily. We could also try to splash in a Gem Lightfoot into like a blue-red deck, and this is a card draw engine. 
which can be fine, but I'm going to continue taking some solid black stuff here. Maybe be a little Grixis pile, and there's a perfect land for us. Black, red, dual land. It also commits a crime when we play it, which is relevant in these colors with some of the better build arounds we might be able to pick up. Yeah, there's not a ton going on in this pack either, so Baron seems like a very reasonable pick. Pick number seven now. Fine little aggressive red creature if we end up going pure blue-red. And trying to be kind of aggressive. Fake Your Own Death is okay with good Enter the Battlefield effects like Vault Plunderer and Bloodseeker, I guess. So that would be fine, but Pitiless Carnage is quite narrow, quite bad. Same with Molten Duplication, just super narrow. Take the Roadrunner here. Discerning Peddler I actually like as fine filler in any red deck, so I might take that over a Skullduggery, which is only really good in super aggressive black decks that also like to commit crimes. If you only like to commit crimes or if you're only pretty aggressive, then it's just okay, but if you're both of those things, it's pretty good. I think Take Up the Shield is the best card in this pack, but I don't really speculate it towards white at all. I'm going to take the Peddler here. Okay, pick nine. We get a Sterling Hound, or holy cow, is still in here towards white. I guess Quill Charger is a fine filler red creature. Now we're on like black, red, splash, blue outlaws, maybe? Committing a lot of crimes. Yeah. We're in an okay spot here. Certainly not my favorite kind of colors to end up in. I think green is just so good in the format. I'm somewhat sad anytime I'm not playing green. And we did not wield a slick sequence. So we will be fighting over blue and red spells, so I'm happy to be so deep into black here, so we can go blue-black or blue-red and splash in the third color, maybe, as a place to be. Although, white, we've wheeled a lot of, like, s decent commons. Nothing insane, but, like, decent commons. Fine with that detour there. We're taking it over just like a quill charger. Pick 11... I mean, I guess Detour's like a 0% chance to play, but don't really want to play Quill Charger at all either. Yeah, there's a lot of like fine white commons running around. We didn't see any huge reasons to be in white, but like Holy Cow and Bighorns are just flying around the pod until super late. I actually think I take Humiliate over Bighorn because we're pretty much locked in on black. So if we do play white, Humiliate's still going to be a little bit better than the 4-mana uh, the 3-4 there. Okay, so here's blue-red dual lands. There's also a Vault Plunderer here. It's a Collective Defiance if we go deep into bl uh, red, sorry. Lila's not looking good here, because we didn't wheel any multicolored spells, and that's part of why I also took Detour there. At a glance, I just saw that this was a multicolored spell out of the Prosperity Post. I hate how these look, because I couldn't easily see what colors it was, and I thought it might have been the, um, the blue-white-black one, which might have been splashable. But since it's the green, white, blue, that's just not going to happen alongside Lila. Um, yeah, I mean, a blue, red, dual land, a collective defiance, or a vault plunder seem the best for us here. I think I'm just going to go for another vault plunder. Get our really solid value going because we still have just like a black, red outlaw deck as a place to be, like not even splashing at all. Ooh. Well, that was quite the pick up here player on our left is definitely not in red if we get a stinger back terror so we are happy to have that happy to be in red pick three intimidation campaign great splash for a grixis crimes deck but it is competing with the jagged barons which is very solid fixing for us i think i still take intimidation campaign although if we're just a black red deck like this is looking streamlined right now so I really don't hate taking another Jagged Barons, but the thing is, if we are just a black-red deck, we don't really need another Jagged Barons that much anyway, because we don't need the fixing that bad. It would still be nice to have another Crime, another land that deals the damage, but I feel like the Intimidation campaign is going to be much less replaceable if we do um, splash towards blue. That card's just going to be very, very powerful for long games. 
Pick four. There's Lazav off of the splash. There's the Soured Springs to fix for the splash. There's the Wolverine, just an infinitely worse version of Vault Plunderer, basically, and we already have two Vault Plunderers. Greed Scambit is just really bad, right? Yeah. Rooftop Assassin's okay. Oh, there's Murder as well. God, I hate the Prosperity Post so much. You just can't even see when there's on-color cards in the pack. We take Murder here for sure. Yeah, I think there's only been one pick I really think hasn't panned out super well for us so far that I haven't been a super big fan of, and that was just because I can't... <laughs> I can't tell what colors these stupid Prosperity Post cards are. Yeah, the only, like, really bad pick of the draft was the Endless Detour. Alright, Consuming Ashes seems good here. We could also splash in Tyrant Scorn or try to run Summoner with some ways to get more power for creatures, but let's take Consuming Ashes. Just excellent removal. Pick six. Oh yeah, Black Red is looking like a really solid colored pair to be in. We see a Terminal Agony, a Rictus Robber. Discerning Peddler. None of these are incredible, but they're all solid. We can also play a Backwoods just to have another Crime. But we actually don't have much that cares about Crimes. It's just the Intimidation Campaign maybe off the splash right now. I'm going to go for the Rictus Robber, I think. Terminal Agony is actually pretty weak removal. Four mana, Sorcery, Destroy a Creature. It's good with Discerning Peddlers, though, if we ended up with a lot of copies of that. Pick seven. Okay, Derailment's much better removal. Blow something up and blow up one of their artifacts at the same time, potentially, later. Also, just three mana instant speed removal. Lackey's fine, and Pillage is fine, but I think Derailment's better than either of those. Pick eight. We can take a Crime with Abraded Bluffs. We also have two random white cards we could try to splash in, so there's like two good blue splashes, two good white splashes. So maybe just a, a white sorcerer's fine. We're taking that over a Raven, a Trick Shot, a Desecrator. Yeah, none of those are that good. I'll take the abraded bluffs there. Pick nine, we get to take a Roded Canyon over really inefficient removal of Trick Shot or super narrow Pitiless Carnage. Seems good. Pick ten. I don't think we're a good Corrupted Conviction deck. We have one piece of token production and it's really narrow. Rictus Robert, it's not even always making a token. I think I'd rather just get the Treasure Provider of the Mine Raider. Not that it's super good, but it's probably better than the other thing there. Um, Fake Your Own Death with Double Vault Plunder is not bad. When I already have five three drops, Mine Raider's somewhat replacement level. Alright, Bighorn, because High Noon is just bad. Uh, Roundup is just bad. And there's a Skull Duggery. Okay, second Lila here. <laughs> That's cool, but we don't have any multicolored instants or sorceries, so it doesn't really do anything. Uh, we completely missed on black and red spells. That's a bummer. Quick Draw and Black Snag Buzzard are both just pretty bad. Even the blue spells here are kind of weak, at least for splash-worthy ones. Lone Shark is the closest, I guess, but Marauding Sphinx, because of the double blue cost, is just not splashable. So we just take the splashable white removal of Mystical Tether, I guess, and basically just completely missed on this opening. Bummer. Okay, pack three, pick two. Another Peddler. It's an Ambush Gigapede for the top of the curve. Splash in an Earth of Joe or a Mystical Tether. Another pack that's not great. Really don't have much top end. I think I like a one of Gigapede here. Uh, here's a Hellspur Brute, which can come out real quick with some outlaws. Five rogues. So we got five outlaws here. One of them's a two drop. Three of them are three mana. Yeah, this is like a four mana, five, four trample. Most of the time, like at worst. Apothecary's fine as well. Or another mourner surprise. 
Yeah, so we could be double vault plunder, double mourner surprise, but I'm going to get some more beef again, looking for more top end than a bunch of mid-range filler creatures in this deck. Put that brute at four mana. Pick four. There is another mine raider. There is another mourner surprise. I think that's better than the mine raider. There is a slick sequence. If we do want to splash in the Lila, there's our one multicolored instant or sorcery. We could also splash this in for cheap removal, but we now have derailment, murder, and ashes on color. So I think I'd rather just grab the mourner surprise here. Pick five. There's another gigapede for the top end. Still cool with another top end creature here. Grabbing that over lackey, which is fine for the deck. Not much else in the pack. Yep, these packs are pretty weak. The only good card here is Cactus Folk Sure Shot for Green Red, and everyone else just hates this pack, <laughs> including me. I guess there might be a green, white, blue player that's okay with Kellen, but every other card sucks no matter what colors you're in. Except, I guess, Failed Fording, sort of. Just take an Outlaw's Fury, I guess, if we can get a really aggressive curve. That can find a kill, maybe. Splash in a Ruthless Lawbringer. With two copies of Mourner's Surprise, that's actually... Maybe a spicy enough splash to do over Intimidation Campaign. I think we're like Black Red Splash Intimidation Campaign or Black Red Splash in Lawbringer here. If we splash in Lawbringer, we get uh, Tether alongside it, so we can splash white removal spells or blue card draw in the end of this draft. Another Outlaw's Fury. I think I'd rather get another creature in here and Rooftop Assassin looks fine in the deck. Didn't get enough two drops to be super aggressive, which is... Slightly rough, but the other options we saw at low mana cost were pretty weak. They were like the one mana one twos. Another buzzard. I guess buzzard is technically a two drop. I could take another Lila. With no multicolored spells in the deck. Spells meaning instants or sorceries here. Actually, Earth of Joe off the splash. I don't think I'm running two copies of Fake Your Own Death. Probably not doing Earth of Joe either, but maybe. Mage Main Lizard's a super bad super filler two drop, so I'm not putting that in here. I could put Duelist in here. Actually, Link Breaker's fine with Lawbringer as, as another option, but I think that's the only thing Link Breaker's fine with, so I'm just going to play the Duelist instead. Got a Trick Shot as an option, but I think the removal's not, a, um, not bad enough to want to do that. Well, I don't love this draft, but I also don't love this draft pod. I don't think we had a super powerful deck available to us. Maybe the best because blue-red ended up being so open would have been... We could have been like a double Lila, double slick sequence Malcolm deck if I just went head first onto it immediately. But blue itself didn't actually end up being that open. Red was decently open, but blue, we didn't see, like, any really good blue cards later in the draft. We opened up good ones early, like a Marauding Sphinx we could have ended up with in that last pack. Um, but we weren't, like, wheeling any premium blue cards. So, I don't know. Full, full omniscience of seeing the future is probably just immediately stick blue-red and never look back. Malcolm into Slick Sequence into Lila. Completely lock in there. But, I think black was pretty open as well, and I'm pretty happy to have been in the color. We still got Vault Plunderers and a Consuming Ashes and Murder and some Gigapedes at the top end with some Mourner Surprises to replay some two-for-one creatures like Plunderers and Gigapedes. So just a solid black core to the deck, pairing it with um, the red, and black and red were some of the most open colors in this draft pod. I think black, red, and white were the most open three. We did pass up some decent white cards. Um, so we could have maybe been like pure black, white or something, but we get Stingerback Terror and 
in playing red here, which is pretty huge. So, yeah, all in all, could have been way worse. I think I drafted fine here. Obviously not incredibly, not perfectly, but this is a very reasonable deck to end up with out of this draft pawn. Okay. So we have one white land and one blue land in this deck for free, essentially. So do we need or want to splash in white or blue then? Because we also have two mine raiders, which give us a treasure probably half the time. So there's a tiny bit more fixing than just one white source, one blue source. Also, a faker on death gives us a treasure. If we want to splash, I think the buzzards are what's getting swapped out. We can splash in a Lawbringer, which is really good with Mourner Surprise, because if the Lawbringer dies, we can Mourner Surprise the Lawbringer back to our hand, make the expendable token, and then immediately sacrifice that token to blow up another non-land permanent. So I do think Lawbringer would be a pretty good splash out of the white. Or we can splash in the blue. We have a lot of crimes in this deck. So Intimidation Campaign is a huge card draw engine for a long game. Or we can play a Malcolm here, and if we manage to cast two spells in one turn, we get to start using this as a card draw engine. So that's another decent blue splash. So blue splash towards like Campaign plus Malcolm, or white splash towards like Lawbringer plus Tether, I guess. Kind of want to go white splash here, but it could be like matchup dependent, where... Because this is best of three, we can swap around. If it is the kind of matchup where we're just not getting anywhere with our aggro and we need to be able to grind out a long game, swapping over to Intimidation Campaign to help do that can be super helpful. Um, but if we are against a deck with a lot of threats that really need to be dealt with, then swapping into the white, getting the Mystical Tether, getting the Lawbringer in there to add to our removal feels pretty good as well. And maybe it's a matchup where we just need to not stumble on mana at all and just be as aggressive as possible, in which case we can choose not to splash at all and have like a Skullduggery Outlaw's Fury in here towards being the hyper aggro build. I like that. I like that flexibility we've ended up with. Which of the three decks is the best to just start it out with, though? With no information of what exact deck we're up against? I feel like I just would like to streamline the deck. How many outlaws are in here? We have three, um, nine, ten. Although this is one of them. So we have nine outlaws, two mourner surprise, or two more outlaws as well. So like 11. I think that means Outlaws Fury is. You know, the board-wide combat trick plus draw a card more often than not. We have to do it late enough. Well, no, we don't, because you can cast the card until the end of your next turn. Okay, so we don't need to have open mana up after the Outlaw's Fury. We just need to be able to cast it the turn after it. Yeah, I kind of like just swapping out the Buzzards for, like, Fury, Skullduggery. That drops us down to 14, no, 15 creatures, which is a little awkward for aggro. But... Still decent. Still 4-2 drops. We have double Mourner Surprise sort of adding to the creature count. Making it like a pseudo 17 creature deck. Kind of like starting this way and swapping around accordingly. We have a couple 6 drops in here and a lot of 4 drops. So I don't think I want to cut any lands here even on a pretty aggressive deck. Don't have a ton of ways to filter through excess lands, but Sterling Hound can mill if we're flooded, and Peddler can get rid of one piece of flood. But yeah, the land count might be a little high, trying to be aggro, but the curve's a little high too. Yeah, 
I'm just going to start with a pure black red build here and swap around accordingly. We'll call it a deck here. All right, here's a look at the final deck list for today. We're on a red black outlaws aggro deck. We just ended up drafting red a lot early with some red blue rares and uh, moved on to black as probably the most open color in the draft pod. So we have a lot of just excellent value plays in black at common, a couple vault plunderers that uh, are going to draw us a card the second they hit the board for good two for ones, a couple gigapedes up at the top end to give us a big creature that also clears out an opposing creature right when it hits the board. So with good two for one creatures like these, as well as some of the uncommon two for ones like Rictus Robber, we can reanimate them with mortar surprises and fake your own death, get another two for one right off, right out of the way. Uh, but out of our red, we have just some decent outlaw nonsense like Mine Raiders into Hellspur Brutes with a couple cheap outlaws to help trigger the Mine Raiders. And then we have the biggest reason that we're still in red, the Stinger Back Terror here for really powerful, beefy Bomb Rare. So just some pretty solid two-for-one value out of black, some decent aggressive creatures in red, plenty of removal from being in some open colors here with Derailment, Murder, Consuming Ashes, as well as some combat tricky stuff with Outlaws, Fury, Faker, and Death, Skullduggery. Looks like a very decent, very reasonable deck to start it off, but we have some splashing options depending on what matchup we're against. If we really need more removal, splash in some white towards Lawbringer. And if we really need some card draw for a really long game, splashing blue can give us Malcolm for clue tokens as well as Intimidation Campaign to really grind out a long one. So very flexible sideboard options in this pool to try to bring it maybe a little bit above mediocrity but we'll see how it all does as we head into the gameplay here we are on the play for game one of round one we have the exact kind of curve out that we're hoping for with this kind of strategy peddler into the mine raider into the rictus robber obviously we prefer if a creature dies but just curving out and getting that extra damage in is going to be perfectly worth it so peddler is just not going to discard a card here i think Now we get to go Mine Raider into the Hellspur Brute and save the Rictus Robber for later. It's a fake your own death for us, not bad. Especially if we get a Rictus Robber on board. Rictus Robber is very good with fake your own death. Because you trade it off and then it triggers its own ability to make your 2 2. We're against green, white, and blue. Pretty terrifying colors. They have a lot of the best uh, rares in the format, as well as tons of fixing to, uh, to get to them out of green. And ramp as well. And there's the ramp and the fixing, the dance of the tumbleweeds it is. So probably against, yeah, a pretty splashy deck here that's going to be running all the most powerful cards they managed to open in their draft. So we didn't hit a mana here to cast Rictus Robber without cracking the treasure, so I might as well just play Hellspur Brute. It's just straight up bigger, and we get to keep the treasure token around towards something that needs it, like Ambush Gigapede. Multiple Tramplers here, so big Outlaw's Fury next turn could get close to lethal. Unfortunately, Fake Your Own Death doesn't give us the treasure token until our Fake Your Own Death creature dies, so if we don't top deck a land, we can't cast both of these and get all the damage in. All right, there's the Buried in the Garden for the Hellspur Brute. That is unfortunate. Especially, oh my god, yeah, if they have two mana removal to go with it because that ramped them into the additional removal. And our 17 land deck has failed to hit land four here. Which is quite bad. We are really letting them stabilize here. Two, three, four, five, six mana for them next turn minimum. Literally every color available. And best we can do is probably Roadrunner hold up a fake your own death here and hope that they're just on more removal. Feels better than just playing a single 4-3. But it's not significantly better. I could Outlaw's Fury just to try to hit a land, but even if I do hit a land, I just play a Roadrunner post-combat. Because I only have two mana up afterwards and I have to crack the treasure to do it. Yeah, that's just pretty bad. The double removal spell plus life gain last turn was really efficient. Actually, double removal, life gain, and ramp off of those two removal spells. 
I could always plot the robber instead of playing the roadrunner there. But trying to keep the pressure on before our opponent can drop their big stuff. There's just way too many cards in this format that just insta-stabilize off of like a single blocker. Even it against a fake your own death. Like uh, Bonnie Paul or something. And again, they are all of the colors, so they probably drafted every rare they managed to see. Okay, so plenty of solid options against Fortune here. If I top decked a... God, <laughs> the mana is getting tilting here, because if we had one more mana, then we could kill Fortune and get Rictus Robber, making a 2-2. Because Skullduggery is enough to kill Fortune, but I only have three mana up after that, which isn't enough to cast the Rictus Robber. I guess if I top decked the land, I wouldn't have top decked the Skullduggery, but then I could fake your own death and Rictus Robber. Because fake your own death costs two, but it gives me one treasure, so it essentially costs one, allowing me to cast fake your own death and Rictus Robber, so still pretty unfortunate. Kind of just Skullduggery here and cast nothing else, I guess? Or Skullduggery plot the robber? Because I think we need to leave all these creatures on board, so I don't think we outlaws Fury or we will lose the Roadrunner. I could fake your own death and get it back, but it doesn't have an ETB effect, so I think I save fake your own death for something that does. It's probably Skullduggery plot the robber here. It's unfortunate we lose out on this treasure and we are never casting Gigapede this game. I mean, I guess maybe we should have just peddled her away Gigapede. Remember if Gigapede was in hand at the time we had the Peddler? Probably was. Feels like it's been in here forever. Taunting us. Okay, well this is going to be a really good turn for us. Unless they have a great 2 mana instant here. This Outlaw's Fury is going to be exceptional. Okay. That was a super good turn, because now Robber's active, too. Really happy with that one. And there's the concession. Okay, so... Luckily, because this is an Arena Open Day 2 draft, the vast majority of the draft queues, the traditional draft queues, are full of other Arena Open drafters, so... They probably didn't get past, like, any bomb rares, so they don't have enough to have drawn one that game, and that is enough for us to break through. They were working towards it, though. That Intimidation campaign potentially set up. They've got all the man in the world. Terrifying deck, for sure. I am almost perfectly fine running it back here and just trying to kill them before they draw enough cards to find whatever big bombs they might be playing here. I actually really liked our Skullduggery and our Outlaw's Fury against this stuff, and those are the cards we would really be like swapping out for splashes here. Um, we're gonna be on the draw, and we're fairly aggressive, so we could cut a land here. I mean, maybe I even like could cut Gigapedes. But what would I put in if I cut a land and I'm not splashing, right? I would cut a land for like Trick Shot. Brimstone Roundup's just super bad. I guess I could play a Buzzard or something. We didn't see any flyers from them, but we only saw like six spells. So we didn't get enough info there, really. I don't know. Like, we have two Mourner Surprise in the main deck, so I really don't hate, like... Throwing in a Braided Bluffs, cut a couple lands, throw in a Lawbringer or something here. Just preempt them. Having some really big bomb creature we super need to kill and trying to use Lawbringer to kill that off of treasure tokens and, and abraded bluffs. I don't know, maybe this is wrong, but I'm gonna do that here. 
Um, actually, we cut a land as well. Still play the Sterling Hound, go 16 here. Maybe we should cut another black or red source for another white, but we have like three random treasure providers for the white source. Can we keep this on the draw? Eight black sources, and we need to draw one basically immediately because we need to be in the aggressive position in this matchup, and this hand is certainly not aggressive without a black source. It is actively doing nothing. Okay, this is worse. It's a one lander, <laughs> but it has both of our colors and three mana leads into a stinger back terror. These mourner surprises are going to be stuck in our hand, though, no matter what. Until very late in the game, which means stinger back terror is actually going to be quite small. Like, we can keep this and ditch the gigapede, sure, but unless I go runner, runner, land, land... I'm not casting anything, and even if I do, I'm casting a Stinger back to her with these stuck. I guess the Hound can fill the grave, but one lander I think is just too risky. All right, Arena. See how it is. Well, we haven't drawn the one card I cut our 17th land for, so these would have been the exact same hands if I was still playing 17 lands. And I think this is multi four and auto lose. I mean, we've got. <laughs> I guess this is slightly better than our last hand, despite not having a black source, because it still has the best play of plotting a stinger back terror turn three. And it's slightly better at getting rid of the whole hand, because I can just ditch the double black cards. So a single swamp, and I can dump the hand out and try to win off of terror. I don't know, this feels like Arena just handed us a loss on this one, but I'm going to keep this rather than mulling to four. Starting three cards down is just almost impossible to win. And while, yeah, this hand is also almost impossible to win, if we hit the swamps, then it's possible. The four card hand would be like only if our opponent draws miserably bad, even with the best four card hand in our deck. Do we get anywhere? And there we go. This hand has officially played better than I think pretty much any four card hand was going to do. Because we immediately went land land. I guess the stinger back tear is technically slightly better in a four card hand though. So maybe if we mulligan into the same hand. <laughs> Except the one card less, the stinger back tear is just even bigger. Hmm. I kind of want to hold up a fake your own death for the stinger back terror. Which is awkward because it means not getting rid of more of my hand. I do have two pieces of graveyard recursion in this deck. And if I top deck a basic off of casting peddler, I could play peddler and hold up fake your own death. I don't know. The only removal we saw from them game one was destroy a tapped creature. And what else was the other one? The other one was um, exile based removal. That's what I was trying to say. So like if they have exile removal, it doesn't matter if we have fake your own death up or not. So I'm just going to peddler here. And if it means I don't have fake your own death up, then anything that kills Terror probably kills it through Fake Your Own Death anyway. Because any exile removal like Buried in the Garden, Mystical Tether, any of that nonsense, it's going to deal with it regardless. And Skullduggery could still save it against green removal spells, like deal a certain amount of damage to a creature, or if they try to like combat trick here. I'm going to snap this block off, I think, with Fake Your Own Death in hand. Okay, they, so they don't even attack. They're going to start drawing cards off of Gem Lightfoot then. They're going to plot and draw a card off of Gem Lightfoot, yeah. And the plot is just a 4-3 flyer. Alright, pretty bad here. There's Vault Plunderer. Um, we can get them to make a terrible block here by just sending in without casting anything. I highly doubt 
they make the block, but if they do, it's pretty good for us, I think. Well, is it even? Because what do I do when they block, right? I, I cast my Skullduggery, which means that I don't have my black mana up anymore to cast Vault Plunder, and I don't have four mana up to play Hellspur Brood anymore. So if they call my buff, my bluff, and make the block, it's actually bad. Like, I can't double spell here unless I cast specifically Faker on death. Which is only if they block Peddler specifically that I'd be happy with that. Because um, I don't get the treasure out of Faker on death if they block the Terror. Yeah, I think I have to just cast Hellsper Brute and only attack with Terror here. It's one less point of damage than attacking in with both if they choose not to block. But if I attack in with both without casting anything and then they block Stinger back Terror... And that's really bad, because I have to Skullduggery instead of playing Hellsper Brood or Vault Plunderer. And I'm cool not having Fake Your Own Death up here, because I think if they had something to try to kill Terror with, they would have tried to kill it last turn. And it's probably Exile anyway. And there it is. Buried in the Garden. Exile the Terror. Nothing we can do about that. Okay, I'm sure there's some more profitable to use one of these spells. If not both. The double block? So that's just fake your own death then. Skullduggery is six power and five toughness. Skullduggery is not enough to save the brute, but fake your own death is really good here. Fake your own death, we kill both. And get our treasure token to play Vault Plunder post-combat. Yep. Unless they've got their own two-mana trick, this should be good. And even if they have their own two-mana trick, like a Snakeskin Veil or um, the Lifelink thing, Lifelink Indestructible, I'll still kill one of their cards at least. Alright, that looked real good. Now I get to Vault Plunder myself here. Goodbye, treasure. Oh, is it the two-mana blue counterspell? That'd be kind of sad. Okay. First we have seen of that. Intimidation campaign, it's back. So with enough removal spells here to pick up the intimidation campaign, they will definitely get us here. And there they go. There's the Heath to do it. They don't have a second black source now, though. So they just drop a fortune. We've got the Skullduggery to deal with that. One to the top, one to the bottom. So they're finding something they do really want to draw. They're down to eight. Here's a Sterling Hound. I don't hate the mountain, but we need another black source to hit Gigapede anyway, so I think I'm milling it. And also 1-3 is pretty in insignificant at this point. Because lands are fine draws, I think I mill both of these. If Duelist was, like, strictly better than a land here, I might keep it, but it's not when we have Gigapede in hand. Any land does do a tiny bit of work towards Gigapede, specifically a Swamp does a lot. And yeah, Gigapede just doesn't seem... or sorry... Uh, Duelist just doesn't seem that impactful here. Try to gamble a little on finding something better. So there's Intimidation Campaign again. They're going to have four mana up here, so they can cast a Crime, pick it up. If they find their Lullaby on the Brute, that's going to be pretty nasty. They go back up to 11, put Campaign back in hand, they only take five on board. And that's what it looks like. They found the lullaby. Really good there. They have a two-mana creature, too. Yeah, Nurturing Pixie. Um, That just picks up a land, though. Oh, it can't pick up a land. It's a non-land permanence that it picks up. We find Mortar Surprise, but we don't have the mana to cast anything we pick up off of this. I could pick up a Duelist and cast it, I guess. Actually, one... 
outlaw. I'll have two outlaws for brute, but that's still one mana off. This is going to be a three mana five four trample. I will have a rogue and a mercenary. So I have to pick up something to cast next turn, which I think our best option is just vault plunder at that point, if I have to wait. I mean, a 5-4 trample is a lot of damage, but 3-1 plus draw card is pretty good, especially with Gigapede in hand, where like literally any draw in our deck is great. I think I plunder over Brute here. It's close, though. There's the campaign. It's doing its thing. Marauding Sphinx. That's a huge roadblock. Five toughness. We're also down to 12, so... That could very well kill us. It's got enough ward that Gigapede basically doesn't have an enter the battlefield effect. So here I could sacrifice a 3-2 to deal 3 to my opponent. Probably not quite worth it. If I wait a turn, then I get to sack uh, one of these three power creatures to maybe do six. If they don't have more creatures, but they've drawn so many cards off the campaign here. That would be unlikely. It's starting to feel like their bomb rare is intimidation campaign. That's all I got. Okay. Dance of the Tumbleweeds. This game's probably over then. What is that? A 10-10? 9-9 nine, nine here. Nope, it's just an 8-8. Eight, eight. They just have a Buried in the Garden on board, making it look like they already have 8 lands. Yep. Ooh, that is insane removal. This was our Mold of Five game, by the way. This was our... Arena gave us an auto loss game and we made it this far. Okay. I was starting to feel really disappointed seeing the 8 8 here and being like, well, this game's over. But then I remembered, wait, this is the game that we just pretty much lost off of Mulligans already. So. Let's just stick around to see a little more information from our opponent's deck, but it's kind of okay that we just got bodied by Dance of Tumbleweeds. I do like the idea of the white splash here, because the biggest problem we're going to have is when they assemble really big blockers we can't get through. The blue splash would be okay as well. We can just try to face off in the Intimidation campaign grind, but I don't think we can double splash and do both colors. So I, I think I prefer the white over the blue splash here. It is close. That's something. I didn't want to drop the Ambush Gigapede there, because it can technically trade into the 8-8 if they try to send it in, but I guess it's not really going to matter, right? Because I just take two more hits from Sphinx, they're not going to attack with the 8-8. But now that I have Outlaw's Fury in hand, I think if I had played Gigapede, this might have been a decent turn to attack all in Fury. It definitely wouldn't find lethal. And then we would just die on the crackback? Yeah, no, never mind, it doesn't matter. But, I mean, Gigapede would trade up into the 8-8 with an Outlaw's Fury, and Plunder would trade into Sphinx if they block wrong. Actually, if I Mercenary up the Peddler, I could maybe have found a kill on Sphinx here. I don't think I can afford to do this now, though, since I've been running one of these into the Elemental. And I don't have the mana to Gigapede and Fury, so we have to just try to set this up for next turn. Yeah, the Outlaw's Fury off the top would have given us the chance of our opponent making blocks that could lead to a victory for us. Still, the could has a huge asterisk where our opponent has four cards in hand. 
and it's basically impossible to lethal them that turn anyway, and they had a counter spell. I guess that wouldn't have countered the Fury, but still. That's an instant speed additional blocker. Maybe I was supposed to Gigapede while they were slightly less open on mana there, just in case they have three interferences here. Ooh! Doesn't matter. That makes the Sphinx lethal. Even if I kill the 2-2 Spirit. Okay. Yeah, I think the only thing we really could have done differently on this one was just running out the Gigapede in that last end step. Then there's a tiny chance that they make blocks that are super profitable for us, but... I just don't think we quite had the tools to win that one just from the get-go with those mulligans. So again, beefy blockers is what I'm the most scared of. I mean, I'm scared of Intimidation Campaign as well, but odds are they only have one copy. They just drew it in the opener each time, which was bad for us. These big dances are, are a problem. We can play around Phantom Interference a little bit more, I guess. Um, for game three. Yeah, I mean, I can throw in a tether now as well and throw in another planes over one of the red sources. 8-8 eight, eight split on red and black and then have two white sources and some treasures. And seven, eight. Boom. What are we cutting for the tether? I guess I'm on the play here, so I might want 17 lands again. Since I'm not on the draw. Maybe Humiliate over Mystical Tether, actually. But then I need to have that white mana somewhat early. No, they had a lot of cards in hand even late in the game with the way that they played out with Intimidation Campaign. Actually, Humiliate over Tether might be a thing. But what am I swapping out? That's the problem. The Outlaw's Fury? Skullduggery of Fake Your Own Death? Probably one of the random tricks, right? Or just the Sterling Hound? I would still have... 15 creatures and two mourner surprises. Maybe one of the gigapedes. These have been just prohibitively expensive, but that's also because I've been kind of flooded lately. I'm going to cut one of the gigapedes, throw a humiliate in, and head into game three. Or when I said flooded, I mean it's because I've been a little mana screwed lately. The opposite. Oh, Rena's got jokes. When it put the hand at the bottom, I thought I misclicked and clicked keep. <laughs> and I was going to get so tilted. <laughs> that would have been so funny that that's how we lose round one. Rena does really got jokes here. It gives us both of our splash cards. Got the Mine Raider, but I have to top deck a two mana or less outlaw to go with it. And I need to hit lands on curve. Yikes. Maybe we should have just stuck black red streamline the whole time. I mean, that's never going to stop us from drawing a zero lander. If Arena wants to give you a bunch of one and zero landers and force mulligans, that'll happen. But would have stopped these two from showing up in this hand. I mean, if I don't hit a white source, which I have two of, or a cheap outlaw, which I have three or four of. I've basically mulliganed these both away anyway. So if I keep this and ditch one of these, I'm still basically on a mold of five. So at that point, you just mold a five for stuff that's slightly better than Mine Raider Assassin, and you don't really want Fury in the opener? I guess, right? And these moles have been rough, but I don't. I don't think this is better than a mold of five. With average draws. All right, mono black. <laughs> mono black zero creatures. No arena. Ah. Uh. 
We timed out of the mulligan and it gave us what it gave us. Oh my god. It ditched the second land? How does it not keep the one card you already put on bottom? Oh my god. Well, I need to speed up for the next round. I don't think it matters a ton, though, because our opponent didn't even mulligan here. Now they're just gonna roll us over. Well, I drew my big dragon thing. Probably Mine Raider into our Humiliate. Actually, this isn't an Outlaw, so I can't even do that. So I have to Sterling Hound first towards an Outlaw, then get the Mine Raider for the treasure for Humiliate. There's an Outlaw Vault Plunderer. With Mourner Surprise, we can mill the other one pretty freely. I don't think I've ever timed out on a mulligan before, so I did not know it was not going to keep the first card we ditched as getting ditched. We ditched Humiliate, right? But then it gave it back to us and ditched a land. I see again. Yeah, there's just swamp. Just making sure. Wow. Got reanimate from the prosperity post on us there. Even. All right. Well, still sucks that we timed out of that mulligan. That was super bad, but I don't think there was much we could do outside of not timing out of a mulligan this game. Still would have been on really rough mulligans against an exceptional hand from our opponent. Yeah, I'm over it. We can kill one of their creatures and trump elsewhere, or we can just trump chump. It's not going to be a way to turn this one around from here. Start things off 0-1, head into round 2. Alright, here we are for game 2, and from here on out, I am not going to do as much commentary. Because I never want to time out of a mulligan again, I did not know it was as rough as it was there. I would think they would have an auto-suggester for the mulligans, not ditch a land and a two-lander, but it is what it is. So we curve Mine Raider after Peddler. Probably means we don't want this excess mana that much. We only have one other red spell in hand, so ditch the Mountain. Starting against a very good blue rare from our opponent. Duelist of the Mind is a 1-3 Flying Vigilance at worst. If they play any card draw, it's going to hit us even harder. And if they commit crimes, which is incredibly easy in blue-black, then it's going to be a 2-3 Flying Vigilance that keeps drawing and discarding a card for them every single turn. So, excellent start. Duelist into the Bloodseeker to immediately commit the crime and hit for 2 here. So the Outlaw's Fury. They milled all lands from the Bloodseeker. We are just curving out with Mine Raider or Plunderer here, are both pretty reasonable. I guess we Plunderer, because here we can just trade Peddler into Bloodseeker. Nope. Alright, I'm still going to Plunderer. Find a Bloodseeker, but we're trying to use Plunder here to dig towards removal for this Duelist, or this is going to just shred us in the sky. I can play a 2-2 Flyer and then also try to throw a Combat Trick of Outlaw's Fury on blocks. 
Outlaw's Fury on blocks is pretty bad, though. Especially when this is going to be small enough that it does die to the Duelist. So I'm only turning it into a trade with the uh, the trick. They have literal thought sees on us here. That is obnoxious with Duelist. Generally not like the scariest card ever. In uh, in draft, it's pretty solid. But the efficiency of it is way more important for constructed formats. That makes it such a threat. In draft, it's like comparable to just getting like humiliated or something. I think we want to just trade into the life linker immediately to make racing a slight possibility. Yikes! Unlicensed hearse commits a crime every single turn. And committing a crime every single turn means Duelist is going to keep getting triggered. And then late in the game, if it lasts long enough, it'll start attacking and is like a gigantic creature. Nice. So I went for the Mine Raider pre-combat into attack because our opponent knows we have Outlaws free, so if I just attack in, they're never going to take that block, but if I play Mine Raider and look tapped out, this Skullduggery off the top can kill the Duelist and we don't have to deal with that anymore. It's pretty dang nice. Still have to find a way to deal with the hearse, but they need another creature to crew it. And if I find our explosive derailment, that's going to be insane in this matchup. Blow up one of their creatures and the hearse. I guess we need five mana towards that, so we'd have to start keeping some land, Sterling Hound, into mana that we actually keep. Yep, they haven't milled the um, explosive derailment, so that is a potential draw. Spring Splasher, just a 2-1. Two 2-1's one. Two good enough to trade into our 3-2 Trample and some other stuff. Uh, our Mourner Surprise is completely blanked by this unlicensed hearse, sadly. Oh, you know what they could do here? I can Outlaw's Fury if they do it, but they can crew the hearse block and then exile two more cards. But then I just Outlaw's Fury and I trade up into the hearse, draw a different card. This is definitely an all-attack. I feel like their best play is probably to just trade Splasher into Raider, but they do have that, uh, that Hearse option. They have the Nuclear option. Okay, so... Because they can just exile our Grave anyway, if I try to Mourner Surprise something back, we're not going to cast that, which means we just cast the better creature, because I'm not really double-spelling. I could Mourner Surprise just as a 1-1 Mercenary to make the board wide because we have Outlaw's Fury. It's so weird, but maybe against Unlicensed Hearse it's reasonable to just get a 1-1 here. Have three attackers with an Outlaw's Fury to try to jam in for a ton. Really don't hate it, but I also like the Sterling Hound Surveil set up our next turn. I'm just going to set up the draws here. I'm going to dig towards Explosive Derailment. But Bloodseeker and Mourner Surprise just as a 1-1 would be a fine thing. And there's already more than enough fuel in the grave for the hearse to go on forever, so I don't think I'm worried about putting more cards in grave. There's, there's 12 in grave before I mill there. So they're never running out of fuel. Give me the Sterling Hound back. Eh, if I draw dead, I'll double spell these. Basically treat this as a Surveil 1 here. Off of the Hound. Should draw into the next card. I'll Surveil the Hound to the bottom.
Okay, at this rate we're not hitting explosion in time for the hearse, so we go wide with Outlaw's Fury. No creatures, please. Put them to one if they don't draw any creatures. They probably have creatures, they just don't have the mana for them. Which is wild. They exiled a bunch of lands from their grave? I'd like to see... No, they've only exiled our graveyard. They've hit four lands, 18 cards in. Insane. So commit the crime with the hearse, draw two off of the seas. It's got to be the land now, yeah. No two mana creature, though. They could have the two mana counter, that'd be rough, but I'm low enough on mana, I don't think I'll ever be able to pay for it regardless. Okay, put them to one it is. Boop, boop, boop. We saw the duelist for like a cheap bomb. Other than that, pretty filler creatures. This might be just like a run it back here, honestly. I like just rolling in. That is three blockers. That's exactly enough. Survive. Oh no, it's not. It's two blockers. I'm bad at math. That's exactly not enough to survive. I, for some reason, thought the Revival was putting both of their creatures onto the board, but it's not, so they're just dead. Oop. Okay. I'm not doing any splashy nonsense this time. I'm just going to run it back, really. We're going to be on the draw, so we can cut a land. We do have an extra draw step this time around, but... I could also just keep surveilling lands into the grave and discarding lands and stuff like I've been doing. Maybe we play a buzzard? We didn't see any flyers. No, we saw the duelist, but... That was the only flyer we saw. We didn't see any reach. Is Buzzard better than a land? Maybe. It obviously depends on the draws. Certainly better than drawing a seventh land. Ever. Yeah. I'll throw in a Buzzard here. Okay. It's a little slow, but it's keepable. Roadrunner speeds it up a lot. I like that. How are you going to hit your... your sweet rare two games in a row, turn two? And this happened to us round one as well. It wasn't a rare, but they hit their disinformation campaign in both of the first two games. In the opener. If I attack in, they're just going to trade Vault Plunder into Roadrunner, and I don't really want to spend one of these tricks that early. When I can spend it on a Vault Plunder, which would be even better. Huh? I don't hate Roadrunner for Plunder as a trade, but they could have their own fake your own death they're trying to sneak in here, so I'm just going to let it through. Spring Splasher, sure. Spring Splasher, sure. That's double crime towards Duelist. This only triggers once per turn, though, so it doesn't matter. Okay, what is the play here? If I attack in with Vault Plunder and they don't block, I am not having a particularly good time. But I can still Mine Raider plus Bloodseeker. I guess in order to get the treasure off Mine Raider, I have to cast it pre-combat, because we don't know if Plunder is still going to be around. Well, yeah. If they block, it's going to still be around. We're going to fake your own death, so... 
We just attack with Vault Plunder. If they don't block, we just Mine Raider Bloodseeker. And with Mourner's Surprise and them not having a hearse here, we mill ourselves. The only reason we were ever targeting them is because they had hearse last game. It was quite the aggressive curve from our opponent this time around. Duelist into Plunder into double two drop, double splasher. It's minus three as well, isn't it? Yeah, so they like blank all of my blockers here because they just scorn away one and then the other ones are zero power. Gross. This is the kind of hand that has a pretty massive play draw differential where this hand's like busted on the play. But if they were on the draw, it is significantly weaker. This is really bad, though. Probably just turned into a loss here. We can mourner surprise our big dragon. And plot it. It's not even on board yet. Or I can mourn or surprise the big dragon and hold up a fake your own death. Hard cast the dragon next turn. I need to not land a single creature through on the ground, but that should be easy enough after casting mourn or surprise. We have four blockers on the ground. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is basically the only line we've got. is to just get all this out of the way fast. Duelist hits us for two in the sky, we go to one. If they have two removal spells, we die. If they have one removal spell, we're still stuck with the triple chump. Oh, they've got the unblockable trick, sure. That works too. Alright, I mean, that was just an explosive hand for being on the play there. I like our deck against that kind of hand, especially on the draw. Like, we've got the Skullduggery there, and we can try to just out-aggro them. So I feel like on the play, we can beat that kind of curve out. And I don't think there's anything in our deck that's even, like, fast, cheap removal to help out. Or anything in our sideboard, I should say. Because the only thing we can do is to splash in more removal, which helps have more removal in the late game. But it doesn't help consistently stop early game curve outs like that. Our best bet against that is to just outrace, and this is our best build to do that. Um, I can drop the buzzard to put the 17th land back in now that we're on the play again. Towards making it to these gigapedes. And I think that's fine. Now let's get in there. Alright, here we are on the play for game three. Let's try to curve out. I might have to go duelist into raider here. To get the treasure towards Gigapede. But Duelist is a significantly slower card to drop out than the Roadrunner. Thought Seize, probably just get rid of Gigapede. Maybe the Mine Raider. I don't think they get rid of a 2-drop because I just have an alternate line there if they do. I really don't hate playing against Thought Seize with this kind of deck. Because, like, we one-for-one one traded into their Thoughtseize and dealt two to them. Somewhat of what we want our cards to do. Trade off one-for-one one plus deal a little bit of damage. Alright, they get rid of the Mine Raider. That definitely makes sense. There's Servant of the Stinger. It's the first we've seen of that. That's pretty bad for us. Find their bomb rare if it manages to connect. Speaking of finding bomb rares, we don't have double red, which is sad. But uh, I guess we gotta just plot this next turn. Man, this means if they didn't thought seize the mine raider, if they had hit the roadrunner to get rid of our best two drop, we could have went duelist into mine raider and then had the treasure to play terror next turn. Because we would have still top decked it next turn. Without the uh, Vault Plunder. Oh wait, no, we drew the Vault Plunder, so it would have showed up later. Never mind. We would have top-decked it a turn after. There's the hearse. 
back again. They can't crew it. They only have one power, so I can still send in the 3-1. Problem is then they get to a connect with Servant of the Stinger and tutor out whatever they need. Because I certainly can't block with Roadrunner. I guess I could just hold up Rooftop Assassin and then I can block with Roadrunner. But it's just a trade, so it's not even, like, good. If I am not trying to stop Servant of the Stinger from triggering, then I should probably send both of these in, because there's no world in which they block with Servant. So I just cash in the extra damage here and then plot a tear and try to just outrace whatever they're pulling out. Although then they just pull out removal for the terror, but then that ends up playing fine for me. They cast it for free next turn, they cast the removal. I can't imagine they block here. If they do, I have the card to make sure it's not bad for us. But I would be very surprised. I'm pretty sure this is just a free extra 2 damage. But they have like a guaranteed way to commit a crime. With a servant to try to jam in with next turn. I guess that's the problem. They don't know what's in our hand. So they might think we're about to just cast another vault plunder and just lock the servant from doing anything. And that is rough for them. Okay. I am pretty fine with that block. Here's the plot. Place your bets now. Will we hit explosive derailment in the matchup against unlicensed hearse? Still leaning on no. It's a 1 out of 29. But then it'll be a 1 out of 28. And then it'll be a 1 out of 27. The odds keep improving. Leave up instance here. <laughs> Mourner's surprise. Uh, I think against a single copy of Unlicensed Hearse, we didn't need to sideboard out these Mourner Surprises, but I suppose that was absolutely an option. This is probably just instant speed removal for the Terror, I guess. They're just going to trade Assassin into Roadrunner. Oh, no, they can uh, crew their Hearse. And uh, block as a 4-4. Four, four. In which case I can Rooftop Assassin to trade up into the hearse. And then my Mourner Surprise does matter if they kill my Stinger Back Terror. I, th I think this actually plays well for me. Trading Roadrunner up into the hearse. So that was kind of lucky. Duelist to the mind. There it is, the three for three. All three games they found the duelist, and two of them they found the hearse. It's good. We found our terror in two of them. We might have had it in all three. I don't remember. I think just two of them. One mana from Gigapede. Well, I've still got Mourner's Surprise here. Do I trade off here? Or just gain two off of the Duelist? I don't think so. I like having the ability to trade Assassins if they attack back. They're down to nine. Grr. Still 
the one thing that's awkward is we don't have a good gigapede target anymore. But getting rid of the lifelink seems good for racing. They just have their own surprise, kill the duelist here. I don't think duelist is helping too much, so that doesn't seem terrible for me. And then if I top deck a land, I can just gigapede the assassin post mourner surprise or whatever. Vault Plunder is the play. And a brigand. Okay. Peddler's a little weird here, because I don't really want to discard Mourner Surprise, but I maybe I'm supposed to towards the land for Gigapede. I mean, maybe I just discard the Gigapede. They're dead in like two terror swings. I guess three because they can block with Duelist one time. But if I get low enough on cards in hand, they are dead to two terror swings, so maybe it's Dish Gigapede? Because I'm also pinging with Duelist here. This might be like the misplay of the event, but we'll see. I don't see how we can top <laughs> our mulligan. But maybe we can. Okay. Turned it into mana, which means the terror is bigger, which is fine. I could pick up the Roadrunner, actually, and that's an unblockable threat. You know? I actually think I do that. Three unblockable damage? On the next swing, so if they don't chump the terror right now, they're dead to Roadrunner next turn. And even if they do chump it, they're very close to dead. We can hit for four off of Roadrunner and Duelist. So it feels like their best scenario here is killing the terror, and then they still take a ton. Get very low on life. So there's the concession, they couldn't even kill the terror, and we are now one and one. Balancing things out as we move on to round number three. Here we are for round three on the play with an incredibly unkeepable hand. One creature, five lands. This is certainly better. We ditch the six drop and hope for the best. Reckless Lackey to start things off. That's actually really good against Vault Plunder. But Skullduggery is solid against that. Our first draw is not a land, and we are definitely looking for lands. Uh-oh. Just red, right, red, white, full curve out here. Skullduggery is really good against their deck. Deals with the Erynx as well. I'm attacking in here because the Erynx can get saddled really easily, and then we have no blocks anyway. I guess I block one damage from Lackey, but I'd rather deal two to them than block one from them. But if they play basically any creature in the game, we can't block Erynx. All right, we have hit zero lands on our first couple draws here, which is pretty bad. Actually, our first three draws at this point. Yeah, without mana, I just can't bet on outracing them. I have to just pass. And Skullduggery on blocks. Hello, Eartha Joe. It's going to give Erynx the first strike here. If they go to combat, I just Skullduggery right now, because they're not going to attack with Lackey, because I can just block it with Roadrunner. Man. Not great. Just fake your own death away the Earth of Joe. Probably just don't even attack with it. They just buff the lackey, send for three. Gross. Never mind. Fake your own death isn't even enough damage now. First strike means fake your own death does absolutely nothing here. We kind of just have to take it.
Top land is super disappointing. I guess, like, it's technically safer to not die instantly to just make a 1-1, one, one, but... I still die to removal. I go to, like, 2 life and there's no recovering there at that point. At least this way I have a slightly better play if they don't have removal. Well, I guess I die either way. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't literally die, but... Those were just really bad draws. I don't think there was anything we could do there. I think that was a reasonable keep. And I don't think we could have kept the 7. So, red-white aggro here. I feel like our matchup's reasonable. I really like the Skullduggery. Trick Shot's actually kind of sweet against a card like Earth of Joe. So we could Trick Shot the Security and the Mercenary. So I can play that over one of these Gigapedes. I don't expect to make it that high on mana that often. I don't love the white splash. I don't love the blue splash here. Yeah. Mostly run it back. Well, you know, Arena's gotta be fair. Arena helped us out a lot. Solid draws getting to the 1k last time they gotta spread the love you know they gotta give it to somebody else here and uh they certainly are at this rate i think with potential treasure and hand trick shots okay i don't think i want outlaws fury in an opener with only two creatures but robbers maybe another one Eh, I'll just go to the 5 drop. I don't know about that one. This is another hand that could be another just oops I lose if we draw 0 lands all game again. Well, we'll see. Our 7 was literally unkeepable this time. Not the greediest player in the world would be like, yeah, I'm gonna top deck like 4 lands in a row. It'll be fine. If I top deck a land, then Mourner Surprise into Mine Raider locks in the treasure. I don't even know if the treasure's that worth it, when I can already plot this for three, so technically everything's castable even without the Mine Raider treasure. Alright, well now I can peddle her into the Mine Raider. Am I getting rid of Mourner Surprise here? There's nothing great to pick up with it. I think I actually am. So I can just keep jamming out enough creatures to... Try to curve into a big Outlaw's Fury, maybe. So far, so bad, though. We're getting bomb reared out, and we still haven't found the third land. Even off of a Peddler card draw. We were on the play, but now we're basically on the draw, because we missed the land drop long enough for them to be on three mana before us. And I kind of have to just murder this, right? Yeah, we gotta slow down here. Endless supply of 1-1s one is not something we're gonna be able to break through. We're attacking with Peddler, because again, any creature in their hand means Erynx's first strike, so it's just too likely for us to be unable to block anyway. Get a treasure token or set up the draws. If I get a treasure token and I top deck a land, I could double spell with these two. I don't think I'm going to want to, but I will have that option. I'm just going to set up the draws. Alright, I guess it didn't really matter what I chose then. We just double spell both of them next turn regardless. Gotta hold all the blockers up and start taking two in the sky every turn. Nine life against a two power flyer. I think I have to ditch brute and just find removal. Or die. I don't think we outrace.
Seven mana here is enough to play the Robber and the Outlaw's Fury. Even if they have removal to kill Rictus Robber, they crack back for six. So I don't even die on the crack back to them blowing up Rictus Robber. So at this rate with no other action, I just go for Outlaw's Fury crack back races. And we just find mana off of it anyway. But now the Rictus Robber does spit out two creatures, so we're even less likely to die on the crack back here. Other for the Robber. Racing two damage a turn, we're dead in two more swings, and all we find is oh, mana. So I can't attack with everybody here, or else they just crack back for lethal. If I attack in with two creatures, I am dead to them top decking removal, or just casting removal on my one blocker. But if I attack with a single creature here and just poke them for like three then the only possible way for me to have any chance this game is to top deck removal next turn. Whereas if I hit them for five, there's a tiny chance I can top deck some kind of combat tricky thing, like the uh, plus two plus oh fake your own death, and also win off of that. So that improves the number of cards that could win the game for me by quite a bit. So I think we just accept that like if they have removal, we're going to lose this game unless I top deck like 100% perfectly regardless. So if they have removal, they have removal. But if they don't have removal, then this is way more likely to have a chance. And they don't have removal. But they did have another creature, so... The odds of being able to... Plus, it's the Vigilant one. God. If it didn't give Vigilance and they sent all out, then we would still have the out of top decking a plus two plus O oh thing, but it was the Vigilant of the whole board once so they still have two blockers up after that. That's exceptionally gross, and we just really flood out there. All right, well. All right, well, that is two round losses, which means we are out of the event no matter what. We drew pretty horribly, we played pretty horribly, we had uh, just everything going wrong here for the most part. I'm still pretty happy with how I drafted. I do think that red and black were some of the most open colors in this draft pod, and this is one of the stronger decks we could have ended up with. Um, but we timed out of a mulligan and turned a, you know, 10, 20% chance of victory in that game in that round into just a 0% chance there, letting Arena auto mulligan for us. That was the biggest punt of the whole event. That was super, super rough. I don't think any of my decisions that I actually made during the games or during the mulligans were uh, particularly bad or particularly horrible. It was just the fact that um, I didn't notice we fully roped out on that one. Um, there was one decision in the draft I think was kind of bad. We timed out of a draft decision as well grabbing an Endless Detour over a Quilled Charger, but in this final build, we would have cut Quilled Charger anyway, so that didn't pan out any differently. Um, but maybe there was something else in that pack that would have been at least sideboard material, you know? So that was a possibility as well. Yeah, taking another look at the deck, I don't think this is bad at all. I think this is honestly on par with the deck that we cashed out the first Arena Open with, getting the full 1k, so... I think just getting a little bit luckier, maybe not timing out on the mulligan decisions there to actually get a chance in that last game. If we had played super tight uh, after the correct mulligan decisions, maybe we would have had a little bit of a chance, but it would have been an uphill battle for sure. We had a lot of really bad hands, really bad mulligans, really bad draws. But as Numod always says, in these kind of events, you have to draft well, you have to play well, and you have to draw well. So if any of those three aspects are out of whack, that is all it takes to kick you out of the events. 
And I think we had multiple out of whack here. I think we drafted well enough, but certainly made some errors in play, mostly just because we timed out. And then, of course, we drew pretty bad on this one, so that is more than enough to kick us out of contention for the Arena Open Day 2. So the end result for Outlaws of Thunder Junction is we are only going to cash out on the first Arena Open, and we'll give everybody else a shot for this second event. So I'm going to go ahead and just resign here since I have no shot at the prizes anyway. Let's not go beat somebody that might be on two wins in their last game and then I beat them and neither of us gets a chance at the day two draft two. Let's just go ahead and, uh, and stop here, resign it here. But unfortunately, that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video or are interested in seeing some more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.